For the first time, Lord, when a sinner turns from his sin, for that first time, Lord, your arms are open wide. And for us, Father, who have walked with you, Lord, and we fall, you are faithful and just to forgive us when we come before you. So, Lord, as we come to your word, Father, we pray, speak straight to our spirits, we pray, that we can act upon this for your glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Really good to see you this morning. It's good to worship God together uh, with such uh, powerful singing and, uh, and playing. It's fantastic, guys. Really good. Uh, all right. Next week, I'm not here uh, next week, um, and so we have a visiting speaker, a young guy from Waterfront Church. The week after, we also have a visiting speaker who's an old, old friend of mine, actually. Um, he was my Greek lecturer in, in, uh, when I was in Bible College. He's a fantastic guy. Uh, uh, one of the greatest theological brains I've come across, incredible knowledge of scripture. Uh, he, was, he was on the teaching staff of All Souls Langham Place for a long time, uh, which is a, a huge church in, in London. And, uh, and he's about to start a church plant in a big development area on the corner of Oxford Street and, and Tottenham Court Road. So he'll be here in two weeks. Uh, so yeah, that'll be, but he's got this um, um, Incredible ability to be really, really intelligent and to pour out some incredible thoughts, but to do it in kind of a really down-to-earth and a funny way. So he's excellent. Uh, just to give you an idea of how intelligent this guy is, uh, when I was in Bible college, I was 22, and I think he was 24. He was the next youngest person in the Bible college, and he was my lecturer. And uh, while I was there, he got a phone call from uh, another college principal called Dr. Peter Masters, uh, to ask him, because he'd heard about Paul, to ask him if he'd come and, and lecture in Hebrew at his Bible college. He didn't have one. And so it was a phone call, and Paul uh, says on the other side, so when would you want me to start? And Peter Masters says, in six weeks. And so Paul's thinking about it in his mind now, not verbalizing over the phone. He's thinking in his mind, can I learn Hebrew in six weeks? <laughs> okay. And that's how, it, that's how it went. So, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's something to look forward to in, in a couple of weeks' time. Great guy, really good friend, brilliant guy, very humble as well. All right, um, uh, this morning, I'm going to begin a little sort of another mini three-part series. It's just been on my mind that the gospel is really important and that we need to get it really clear in our heads as a framework for all of life. And so I think um, in church, we can get caught up with doing lots of different things and teaching lots of different subjects, and it's, it's really important. But if we haven't got a very clear framework of the gospel, then we really don't see what life is all about, and we really don't see people as God sees people, and we really don't see what the main thing is. So I wanted to do that over three sermons. So I've called this little sermon series, The Essential Three. Nice little image should be coming up at some point. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the problem. So the first one is going to be the problem. Second one is going to be the solution or the answer. And the third one is going to be the final destination. We're looking at a particular verse this morning, which is Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. So if you have a Bible with you, it's Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Very famous verse. It's often one of those verses you might see in a sports stadium and someone's holding it up, John, uh, Romans 6.23. It says this, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know if you can see in that sentence there. It's a sentence of contrasting parallel statements. There are two roads uh, that everybody can take in life, and that everybody will take in life, two directions, two approaches to life, which will end in one of two destinations. 
And that's what we have in this, this, this statement here. The wages of sin is death. Wages is what you get given for work that you do. It's what you earn. Whereas a gift is something that you're given without having earned it or deserved it. It's something that is free for the one who receives the gift. So you see the difference between working, wages, getting something, a gift being given freely. So let's unpick this, this statement a little bit. So the wages of sin. Now, I think a lot of people, when they um, think about God and they imagine how they get into heaven, they imagine that they will be able in some way to earn it, either by doing good works or by uh, an amount of religious practices, religious effort, or if they're not kind of into good works and religious effort and doing religious stuff, it's generally they would imagine I'm a decent person, and so that would get me in. And they imagine that there's a pass mark. And if I can hit that pass mark, and no one knows exactly what that pass mark is, but if I hit that pass mark into heaven, I'll get in. And I think most people, if you speak to them, would imagine that either through being good enough or being religious enough or by being decent enough that they would probably be past that pass mark. But the Bible gives a flat no to that view. It says completely not. And if you look in Romans 3, if you have a Bible, Romans 3, verse 20 and verse 23, it'll be up on the screen. So if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Romans 3, verse 20 and 23, it says this, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So by, by doing things to, in order to keep God's commandments, works of the law, earning wages, rather, it says, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So all our efforts are actually producing sin. And then verse 23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person, all fall short of the glory of God. All right, I just want to make three statements uh, about sin. First thing is this. Uh, point one, we have sin inside us. We have sin inside us. The, the theologians call it inherited sin. This is what it says in Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just the sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Okay? So what that's saying is, all of us are sinners. All of us are actually born in a position of being um, sinners. And all of us choose sin. We choose to remain in that position of sin also. In terms of proving that, uh, you only have to look, don't you, at a young, very young child, and you know that you don't have to teach a child to be naughty. You're constantly trying to teach a child to be good, but there seems to be something in every single child to want to be rebellious and to want to be naughty. It's something in us. I think uh, an image that a lot of people have is that we are completely good people, but then because of um, outward circumstances and pressures and temptations and stuff, we sometimes make mistakes or we sometimes do bad things, but it's, it's out there. It's not us. But the Bible says, no, 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 it's not out there. They're kind of mitigating circumstances, if you like, pressures, temptations, yes, but they then start inside. There's something in us. You know, um, I think it's difficult because we look at other people. I don't know if you look at other people and you look at their perfect lives and their perfect smiles and their perfect personas on TV or whatever it is, and they look perfect. And so I guess a, a, a sermon like this this morning, you're like, I can't be right, Neil. I can't be right. I know you're saying it's not your idea. It's the Bible saying it. I can't be right that everybody, everybody they're bad people, but they're good people. Yes, there are people who do some really good things, definitely. But every single person in the world, the Bible says, has a sinful nature inside them. I think, I think everybody has an outside Facebook persona. You notice that you look on Facebook and people put their family pictures on. And do they make you feel jealous sometimes and possibly sometimes angry? When they're like, this is my family, you're down the beach. This is my family on holiday. And they're like, they look so happy. 
You're like, why can my family be as happy as that? But people don't put the natural, the normal photos on Facebook. Yeah, as we were my son, uh, he didn't want to come up with us today. Yeah, yeah, as we were my daughter, uh, she's in the middle of a real tantrum at the moment. Look at her face. <laughs> yeah, as me and my wife, yeah. Another argument over the dishes. We don't, we don't stick that on Facebook, do we? We just put the per- we want everybody to see we're the perfect family. But every single person, if you spend any amount of time with anybody, whoever they are in the world, whether they're wearing religious robes or whether they've got a smile that they've had fixed for them at the dentist, every single one of us, every single day of our lives, do things that are wrong. The Bible calls that sin. We, we commit a multitude of sins in our actions, but more than that, in our thinking and also in our motives. It's really tough. I don't know if you've noticed. So even when you're trying to do good things, there's kind of motives in there that are, oh, but I'm doing this because I want people to love me. I want people to worship me almost. I'm doing this for selfish reasons. So there's all kinds of things wrong with our motives as well as our thoughts, as well as our actions. Uh, I think it's really helpful. A lot of people say this, but um, in order to kind of really nail this for all of us, if you imagine if all of us had a TV screen built into our chests and that TV screen showed what we were thinking at all times. So people can't see that, can they? They can hear what we say, they can see what we do, but they can't see what we think. Imagine if we had this TV screen in front of us and everything that we thought right now, we'll be on that TV screen for all to see. We wouldn't want that TV screen to be on, would we? We would be smashing that TV screen. And so the Bible says that we're all sinners, and it's in all of us. And often we don't see it, we can't see it, we struggle to see it, because it's almost natural to us, isn't it? It's part of who we are. So when we do it, we choose to do it. And it's not until God sometimes shines his kind of torchlight and... And before, we couldn't really see, but then God seems to sort of do something, and he shows us, and we're like, ah, oh, I never realized. Gosh, I never realized that was bad. I never realized I was doing that. And you see how ugly it is, and you realize then, man, I am a sinner. But it takes God to show you. But this is a, a really important point, guys. Every single person you see in this world uh, has a sinful nature and is desperately in need of God. That's the first point. Uh, Second point, we cannot be free of sin. We cannot be free of sin. Neil spoke last week of of sin for him, or drug addiction, being something that he both loved and hated at the same time. He loved it, and the the buzz he got at the time, and he really wanted to do it, but then he hated it because it was destroying his life. Sin is like that, isn't it? We love it, we choose to do it, we keep on wanting to do it, we feel an urge inside to do it, but sometimes we think, why am I doing it all the time? It's ruining my life, it's making me into this kind of person, it's affecting my marriage, whatever it is. So it's kind of something that we both love and we hate. Romans, uh, oh no, John, sorry, John 8, verse 34, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. We would love to think that we're completely in control all the time. And what we decide, what we choose, we do. But the Bible says we're not as in control as we think we are. And the way to prove this is that, okay, so if we're in control, we should be able to decide. Think in my mind now, make a decision with my mind and my will, I am not going to be angry or jealous at all this week, or whatever it is, you know. And try and go through that week then, because you should be able to, shouldn't you? If you've decided, that's what I'm going to do, you should be able to do it. But we can't, can we? There's another power inside, which is often more powerful than our decision and our mind to do something. Let me give you a little story. I think I've, I've said this story before. Forgive me if you, if you remember it. Uh, it's the story of the scorpion and the toad, okay? And the, the scorpion one day goes up to the toad, 
at one side of this river and says to the toad, Mr. Toad, uh, I'd like to get across to the other side of the river, but I can't swim. This is where you come in, Mr. Toad. Will you carry me across the river and jump across and swim little bits and so on on your back, please, Mr. Toad, please? And Mr. Toad looks at him and is like, you serious? You're a scorpion. You could kill me. You've got that kind of nasty tail. And you stick it in and you sting people. No, I'm not. I'll carry you across. I'd be nuts. And the scorpion's like, but think about it. No. And then all of a sudden, the toad feels this excruciating sting in the back of its, of it, of its back. And he lets out this uh, blood-curdling yelp and turns around at the scorpion and says, why? Why'd you do that? I, I'm going to die now and you're going to die. Why? And the scorpion just looks at him and says, I, I don't know. I just I couldn't help myself. I guess it's who I am. And they both go down. That's a little bit of what sin is like. We would love to be totally in control of everything, but sometimes we just can't help ourselves. It's in there, and we cannot get rid of it. Thirdly, uh, God has to punish sin. God has to punish sin, okay? So sin is in us. We can't get rid of it, but God has to be just, and he has to punish sin because he's a holy God. And he's a just God. So when people do things that are wrong, God needs to be just and punish things that are wrong. If you imagine um, if you were covered in petrol and all around you was this raging fire, how would you feel? You'll feel pretty petrified, wouldn't you? Because you would be covered in this substance that's highly flammable, surrounded by this fire. And the Bible says that nothing that's impure in any way can possibly enter into heaven. It's kind of like, because we're sinners, it's kind of like being covered in this substance which is highly flammable, and then approaching God, wanting to get into heaven, and the Bible says that God's like a consuming fire. And God's holiness and purity and our sin, they just cannot come together. God has to consume sin. That's the situation that every single human being is born into and living in, in this world. That's the reality. So as we look around at every single person, the Bible says everybody sins, everybody, and falls short of the glory of God. All right, back to the verse. The verse says, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, what you get uh, for the sins that we commit is death. Okay, death. Now, we're not dead now, are we? No, not completely. But actually, the Bible says in, in Ephesians 2 verse 1 that we are dead in Sins, dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. So what does that mean? Okay, the, it means basically that we have a, a spiritual side to us. All of us have a spiritual side, not just a physical side, but a spiritual side. Because we are sinners inside, uh, our spirits before Jesus are dead. The reason that we know that they're dead is, is twofold. Let me tell you the reason that I can kind of prove to you that you have a spirit that's dead, maybe, okay? Uh, one of them is this. Uh, first of all, every single person in this world is desiring satisfaction. Everybody wants to be fulfilled, get happy, yeah? And so what people do is they try to think, what do I need to do in order to get happy? And they do all kinds of manner of things which are on the kind of physical level. And they get satisfaction on the physical level, but it doesn't quite work, not completely, not fully satisfy like there's something not quite hitting the mark. And so I'll try something else, physical. That doesn't quite hit the mark. And I'll try something else, physical. That doesn't quite hit the mark. I don't know if that's you, where you're constantly trying different things and thinking, I, you know, my life isn't really that great. I'm not being satisfied. Why is that? I'm trying everything here. And the Bible says it's because we're not just physical beings, we're spiritual. And we need our spirits to be alive to God. And when God is connecting with us and speaking to us and walking through life with us, 
That's our spiritual side, being fed, being catered for, feeling alive. And so we're being satisfied physically, we're being satisfied spiritually. But until Jesus, the Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Secondly, you can know that we're dead because um, if, if you're not yet a Christian, you'll feel that there's this blockage between you and God. I know if you sense that, any of you here this morning who aren't yet Christians, that uh, you maybe think there's a God out there, but he doesn't seem that close, and you've never seen him, so how can you believe in a God you've never seen or experienced? He just seems really distant. But the reason he's distant is because spiritually we're dead, and when we come alive, he just comes so close into your life. Feels like he's right there with you at the time. And so the Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sins. But it does say that there is another way. So if we go back to that verse, if you can put that verse back up for us, James, uh, Romans 6, verse 23. And if you can uh, see the parallels. So it's not wages, what we do, but it's gift. It's not uh, the sin that we contribute, but it's something that God does. And it's not leading to death, but instead it leads to eternal life. See the parallels, the contrasting parallels? And it's through or in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's where the answer is. Okay, let me ask a question here. Uh, basic question, how can God be a God of love and grace and compassion, whilst at the same time a God of justice and holiness and wrath? You ever ask that question? How do we get, how do we get this in our head? Okay, so God is a God of love, an amazing God of love and grace and compassion on the one hand. And then on the other hand, he's a God of holiness and purity and justice and wrath. And so the Bible speaks about this coming wrath. How do we kind of understand that? Well, the Bible also says that, you know, there's an appointed time, an appointed time. And that time will be after death when God will judge, okay? And at that point, well, God will be just, and God will be holy, and God will be wrathful at that point. We'll experience that. But until then, God holds back his justice for that appointed time, and he says, you know, he's patient with all of us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so every single day of your life right now, God's love pursues you. God's love pursues us. Every single day, God holds out to every single person, listen, I want to give you something. I want to give you the most amazing gift. I'm saying like, stop trying to earn it because you can't earn it. I've done it for you. Every single day, God pleads with people to say, listen, I love you. I love you more than anybody could possibly love you. I sent my Jesus, my son, to die on the cross for you. This is how much he loves you. And he on the cross took all the sin that you committed, everything you've ever done, the big stuff, the little stuff, the thing that you've forgotten about, the thing that you don't know about, he took it all on the cross so that every single sin can be completely wiped out in an instant. That's my gift to you. That's my grace for you. And so God says that every single day, I don't know how many days that would be in a, in a person's lifetime. Days, weeks, months, years and years, every single day, every single day for 70 years, for 80 years, for 90 years, for some of us maybe. But then he says, but then there's going to be that point where I'll take it as that's it now, total rejection. I know you don't want me. I know you don't want my forgiveness. And so God accepts that then. And then we... I guess, become the recipients of God's wrath and God's punishment for sin. Do you understand that? But while you're here this morning, guys, let me read that verse again. The wages of sin is death. That's our efforts. That's what we are contributing at this moment in time. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the gift that God is willing to give you today. How do you receive it? It's as simple as ABC. 
as simple as ABC. First of all, admit that you are a sinner. That's what you need to do. In order to know Jesus as Savior, you have to admit that you are a sinner needing a Savior. So come to Jesus and just say, I know I've done wrong things. I am a sinner. B, believe that Jesus can save you. Believe that he died to save you from all your sins. He'll take away it all. Just believe that. C, commit your life to God. Bring it to God. Say, I'm not going to live my life my way anymore. Right now, I'm ready to commit to living for you, God. Are you ready for that now? Are you ready to know forgiveness? Are you ready to accept Jesus? Are you ready to commit your life to living for God? If so, you can pray right now and become a Christian. And we're going to do that. Just pray together. Father, uh, we want to come to you. And for those uh, who are here this morning who aren't yet Christians, uh, God, we, we want to be able to say to you now uh, that we admit that we are sinners, God. We can think of so many things that we've done that are wrong. But we believe that Jesus has died to take away all our sin. And we want to accept him as Savior. And we want to come now and commit our lives to you. I want to commit my life to you, Jesus, right now. Father, will you come into my life? Will you help me to feel alive spiritually? In Jesus' name, amen. Should we stand together to respond to the word?
for the love that you have revealed to us this day, Lord. And we thank you that the love that we share with each other, Lord, is your body in this place. Lord, we pray the words that have been spoken into our souls today, that have been sown in, Lord, watch over them, Lord, and protect them, Lord. And Lord, if someone has prayed it for the first time, Lord, may they be proud and stand forth and start committing their lives to you, Father. Lord, may these words take root in our spirits, Lord, and produce wonderful things, Lord, for your kingdom and for the people around us, Lord, for the, the blessing that we should be to the people around us. Lord, as we walk from this place, may we be alert, Lord, by the promptings of your Holy Spirit for the kingdom work that, that needs to be done through your body, Lord, this week. Father, we thank you for your presence today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we in some small way have been able to honor you, Father, and give you the, the praise that you so richly deserve. For those scars, Lord, we will be able to touch those scars in heaven, Lord, that you died for us, Lord. We'll be able to see them. We'll be able to touch them. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. For your glory, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. If we don't see you tonight, have a good week, everybody. And